Welcome to all for what promises to be a vibrant discussion around the future of manufacturing in developing markets. As we only have 45 minutes together, I would invite you to refer to our speakers' bios on the forum portal, and I want to just briefly set the stage for a free flow conversation among our experts. We've assembled you all today at a fascinating time for global trade and supply chains. In the trade world, we often think of the 2001 entry of China into the WTO as the start of the modern era, when the Shenzhen Special Economic Zone really exploded and China earned its reputation as the world's factory. More recently, though, we've dealt with two cataclysmic eras that have called into question whether to rework how and where to source manufacturing. I'm referring, of course, to the US-China trade war and the COVID pandemic. But there's even more than that going on in keeping global goods trade thriving. A seemingly unstoppable tech boom is underway with semiconductors in the spotlight and as businesses and governments grapple with how to satisfy intense demand, not just for that work from home equipment, but all kinds of faster and smarter digital products as we dive further into this fourth industrial revolution. Businesses might have been slower than analysts originally had predicted at reworking their supply chains in these volatile times, but we're all grappling now with how and where the world's manufacturing will be dispersed over the coming decades. So with that, I'd like to just open with a question and ask anyone to jump in and kick us off. And that is, what are the biggest factors right now for business decisions to relocate manufacturing? Is it proximity to other parts of the supply chain? Is it political trade ties, trade agreements of the host country, technological competence and IP protections in that country, ESG protection? protections and considerations or something else. So if I could ask someone to help kiss, kick us off on this conversation. Yeah, I mean, uh, Michelle, I can take this to kickstart the conversation. I, I lead a business, so I will look at it from a business perspective. I think everything is fundamentally linked to customers and consumers where they are, right? And how that's coming through. So everything that we talk about as factors will be driven by that. And I think what's changing the business landscape, in addition to the geopolitical and pandemic piece that we talked about, the first piece is the form of consumers, both the location of demand and the nature of demand that's changing. And that is an important factor in basically planning your supply chains and manufacturing uh, setups. The second thing that is coming on both, uh, very importantly is the technology elements. So, you know, the digitalization and data that you talked about, that will be an important consideration as one looks at it. And the piece that has not come into conversation as yet, but it's becoming more and more relevant, is the, the sustainability, the environmental and the social element or the impact that it will have on value chain. So I think these factors are going to be equally critical as people think about, because the pandemic is just an eye-opener to in terms of what could happen. And the, the realization that resilience as much as efficiency is going to be an important part of designing supply chain. So for me, those are the important elements, of course, as you talk about consumer demand, the consumer demand is getting dispersed the world over. And that is a realization. Uh, you know, many years back, the developed markets were the hub of consumption, but now it, uh, it's getting more dispersed across the world. So Asia is expected to be a large part of demand or consumer and customer demand in the coming time. A lot of investment happening in building up of uh, supply lines and supply chains at the, uh, behind the uh, scene, as much as investments in ensuring that you can mitigate risks uh, uh, to businesses that COVID has highlighted or many other things that are highlighting it, whether it's ransomware threats that we are seeing across the world, whether it is a, a, a COVID kind of a crisis or the geopolitical uncertainty that's coming through. So I think those are some of the pieces that uh, uh, will help us in deciding. But this dispersion of demand, development of supply chains, and, and the expectation of customers to be served faster and more customized I think is going to drive us closer and closer to uh, supply chains to get closer and closer to customers, uh, in, in my view. Walter, I know you had something to say about that. Was... Well, I did. Um, early on, I was one of the guys that went to the uh, Shenzhen uh, economic zone back in the days when you took a bus to get across the border into China. And it was the most fun time, but I can tell you, that I was looking for a cluster of some sort of skills because we had a blank sheet and we are one of the biggest scissor makers in the world, perhaps the biggest. And so I needed metal working. I needed some level of skill. And we found such a place. It was in Yangjiang, China. It's in Guangdong. And we would take a, we would take a gin by, and that's an old Chinese car. And it would take us eight hours and we'd have a bucket of beer and drive for hours and hours and hours. 
And when we'd get there, they'd be stamping out metal. And it was that that was the key thing. We could see the start of a business. And from there, we started to add technology. And I don't think it's changed much. Um, and as I'm looking right now in places like Myanmar and in Pakistan for similar kinds of uh, uh, clusters of skills, we're finding them. To bring in the Deputy Undersecretary here, sir, did you have something to say about the dispersal or the geographic uh, distribution of these manufacturing states? Uh, thank you very much for having me here. I think uh, if we see over the past years and over even the decades that we moved from part to part, we moved from the globalizations in the early days where US and UK as an economies, they moved there, they outsource their their manufacturing to, to more towards to the east. And even though, even with the current situation now and the current economy, now there is also a new trend became where uh, the protectionism high, high as well and the free trade agreements became more trendy uh, these days. Now with the pandemic as well, we, there is a new structure and uh, where these economies and even our economies in the GCC region, we see that, we observe that we, we, we need some other hubs to, to, to be more closely to, to, to the region and more closely to the, uh, to the, to, the uh, to, to, uh, to our locations. <laughs> So I, I, I believe we need to come up with an, uh, with an initiative, an international initiative, where we where to, to secure the supply chain and to secure the free trade agreements between among the countries. And also uh, this initiatives will, will will uh, facilitate fairly distribution between uh, between the, uh, the, the, the between the countries. I know a number of panelists are eager to jump in. Um, uh, please, whoever would like to to respond uh, to the deputy undersecretary. Well, I, I actually wanted to go back and just add some further comments to some of the things that Anil said. And I agree, proximity to consumers are very important. Access to technology. However, if you're in the low tech industry, such as footwear and apparel, very dependent upon people to manufacture goods, we've seen a continual move westward from China to Vietnam, Cambodia, Bangladesh, and now East Africa, I'm sure West Africa as well. And whilst that's presented opportunities uh, and there is a developing business in East Africa, it's really heightened actually. Um, particularly in the COVID environment where transporting goods and materials around, how close it is, how important it is to have proximity with all layers of your supply chain. Four or five years ago, we thought nothing about shipping materials all around the world and just uh, decompartmentalizing different steps of manufacturing. That's now becoming a really big issue. And, I, and I'm seeing more and more opportunities for people to to invest in automation actually back in some of the more developed countries like Vietnam and others. And I think there's a really good runway for manufacturing there before we go to the four corners of the world. Yeah. May I just jump in on that comment? I'm sorry. Okay, so I think I was going to say exactly the same thing, but a slightly different angle. Um, I think there is definitely, a, a, you know, a awareness uh, now that we have gone through this pandemic um, sort of transformational um, sort of phase of the economy and society that uh, I think there is a sense that uh, people are looking at this new business model to be, you know, one inch closer to the consumption of consumers. But at the same time, I think there is also, um, a, a, you know, a, a higher level of awareness in terms of what technologies can do to optimize um, you know, this type of operation where we used to think, okay, you actually make this part of compo the component in Japan and that part in China, and then you actually, you know, come up with a very complex, um, you know, interlinked, extremely, you know, fancy uh, supply chain touching God knows how many countries, um, you know, which we said, okay, we can do this with technology. But I think now in this 
at this time, we are now at this stage where we need to utilize the technological advancement to optimize uh, supply chain a little closer to where the demand is happening. And I think that's a new sort of uh, awareness just because we have been forced to think that way. Uh, not only just being closer to 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 the the the, uh, the consumer, but also how do we optimize um, the localization of a supply chain uh, by embracing digital technologies, which we used to think in a in a context of global economy, global trade supply chain, and we are thinking that. Um, uh, in a same similar uh, in a in similar way in terms of utilizing technology, but apply that to the very local level, the very local market level. I think that's something that's kind of new, uh, just because we were not thinking before the COVID um, situation. We're thinking more the global supply chain, digitization, you know, blockchain, you know, making sure that this dot and that dot is connected from you know different countries. So I think that's a new new. Um, New uh, new awareness that I, I started to own notice in many countries. Thank you for that. And uh, I know Nilesh and Abdulaziz both uh, have raised their hands as well on this. Uh, I also want to add just uh, one further question uh, related to that. Um, do you think, especially I'm hearing a lot that technology is going to be a big driver of these decisions and the technological competence of the, the host country? I mean, where do developing markets land in this, this sort of competition? Are they going to continue to be able to uh, drive market share for the, being the host country for these manufacturing sites? So uh, if you don't mind me chipping in here, Michelle. <clears throat> well, first of all, good morning, everyone. I'm really grateful to be among a great panel. Uh, I think the topic of having those manufacturing hubs and how to then countries really depends on which lenses you're wearing because governments look at this from a certain perspective while multinationals and, and private companies look at this from a different uh, lens. And what I've seen is that governments are driving more towards, at least in this region, more towards resilience and having those manufacturing hub there looking for value adding and also taking into consideration a new angle that wasn't very evident before, which is sustainability and environmental impact. And that's great. But at the same time, when we take a look at what multinationals are looking for and how uh, uh, private sector is looking at this is basically what has been mentioned before, which is accessibility to uh, neighboring markets and accessibility to a bigger consumer market and talent, basically. Uh, while, while understanding what technology and how technology is going to disrupt those factors in the future, and I think that this fourth uh, industrial revolution and how we could move those industrial uh, uh, supply chain closer to uh, uh, to the bigger markets is much doable. Uh, uh, totally understandable and how we can actually ensure that those uh, uh, supply chains could be localized. And if we take a look at what we have been through, I'll, I'll give you an example from, from Qatar. Uh, pre, we've been through a blockade and, and that, that blockade actually have shocked our uh, uh, supply chain. And that's where we focus more around ensuring that we have resilience within our manufacturing hub. And this is where also COVID have impacted other, other uh, uh, internationally and other countries and how they view their uh, local supply chain and moving more towards the point that I think was mentioned also earlier by His Excellency Saud al Atiyah is that protectionism is, is moving more and more into the picture. So how can you mesh this, this picture between what the governments are looking for and what private sector and multinationals are looking for? Ensuring that technology actually can enhance the, value, the local value add and governments will need to focus more on creating local talent. That local talent will ensure that so accessibility to, to neighboring markets is done by geography most of the time and ensuring that you have the right infrastructure. Uh, for example, in Qatar, we have state of the art port and accessibility to uh, a great neighboring uh, countries and uh, accessibility to a bigger uh, market. But at the same time, to ensure that there is a great uh, uh, system within the education, ensuring that you're producing great talent, that will enhance your possibility to create a more impactful manufacturing hubs. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you for that. Yeah. <clears throat> so I'll just touch upon uh, you know, the topics of technology, sustainability, and how that is uh, impacting on some of the geography. And if you don't mind, I know I'll just use some numbers and statistics just to support my uh, point of view. <clears throat> so as of today, if you look at, you know, the uh, 
manufacturing productivity per person in vietnam it is about $6000 in india it is about $10000 and china is $30000 germany is $65000 us is $55000 so you see that big difference in terms of how the technology is helping some of these uh, developed world uh, in terms of having the higher productivity now what that technology is you know in terms of uh, so if you take the robot uh, density uh, you know the countries like germany japan they have 30 32 robot uh, per 1000 people uh, whereas in china it is 10 or india it is hardly about 2 so the penetration of technology penetration of automation is kind of on the lower side in the developing part of the uh, uh, economy and hence the productivity uh, in this part of a world is is kind of different so what it means is merely just having resources or the labor arbitrage is not going to help the developing economy to take and build the manufacturing but then on the other side now when you look at sustainability then you will see that you know the carbon footprint per person um, the countries like india vietnam uh, it's just about 2 tons the country like china is 7 and a half germany is 9 and a half us is 15 and a half so it doesn't mean that you know the technology is there only in the developed world and then only the developed world will take because they will have a big challenge of how they are going to justify it you know from the sustainability perspective so the technology and sustainability it need to get properly balanced now when you look at in the future it's not that the traditional manufacturing is growing you know it is mainly the pharma is growing it's not the traditional ic engine automotive is growing but it is the electric vehicle and autonomous vehicles are growing it is the consumer electronics is growing the defense and space manufacturing is growing now all these sectors of manufacturing are very very technology driven so as we go ahead you know the things like uh, cloud and ai 5g these are the things which are boosting industry 4.0 coming even to qatar you know i mean uh, when we are discussing with qatar with uh, qatar port and all that we are not discussing the manual operation we are discussing how the 5g will help to build the future of a port over there and the automation over there and many of the countries you know when i look at like china has defined china 2025 malaysia has defined industry forward india has defined samarth udyog vietnam has recently published their national industrial policy for 2030 so that's how the developing world is kind of gearing up saying that okay which is the uh, you know the future segments sub verticals in manufacturing which will grow and how they should get ready uh, to skill their people to adopt the technology and that's the only way you know it is going to help the developing world uh, to build the manufacturing and then have the distributed supply chain coming in this part of the world. Thank you for that, Neelish. And I, I do want to bring in Jerry here. Uh, if I could also just add one one question, and it's related to something that I'm hearing from several speakers now is the, the ESG considerations. How do you move toward a more sustainable uh, technology future, uh, even as you're, you're bringing in all these 5G technologies and fourth industrial revolution? Uh, you know, we've talked a lot about this and, and these circles uh, about bringing in ESG and, and having a plan, but a lot of times it lacks standardization. So I, I wonder if, if uh, anyone has thoughts on, uh, you know, what concrete objectives or what concrete goals and achievements, uh, you know, a country or a business can show to, to really attract manufacturing sites to, to that constituency. But uh, yeah. Jerry, first, if, if you had something to say on the sure. earlier topics. Yeah, um, three key points I want to make. First one is that um, this point about global supply chains becoming more regional, more decentralized, is something we have been talking about in the in the global trade uh, circles uh, for almost a decade now. And um, one of the biggest steps that has uh, taken by the WTO in uh, 2013 was the uh, development of the trade facilitation agreement that really uh, put the emphasis on helping developing countries build the right infrastructure to enable trade and to enable uh, tra uh, trade flows so that, you know, the world wasn't just a one-way street, you know, China to, to the West, but actually it was a multi-point multi world. Of course, COVID kind of accelerated this whole and it's been a very beneficial 
uh, it will become very beneficial in that sense on, on trade. And, and it's finally come to the point where, um, where, where this is becoming important because companies are just shifting their whole thinking from uh, you know, one or two hubs in, in the world in manufacturing on multiple hubs, given all the uh, pressures and points that uh, other colleagues just mentioned. One thing I want to mention though here on ESG, which is very, very critical, and, and this is my second point, is that we are seeing organizations and companies uh, shifting their focus on sustainability and ESG from risk mitigation to value creation. And more and more companies are actually asking um, themselves and they, 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 they get questions from the boards and, and from the shareholders saying, how can they use ESG? How can they use sustainability to create value for the company rather than just mitigating risk? In other words, you know, I don't just want to implement some initiatives to reduce my emissions and improve, just meet some regulations, but I actually want to do it because I can create value for my customers, I can create value for my products, new market share, and so on. Now, that's very critical, which brings me to the third point, is because as this shift is happening, it's impossible to think of a company um, you know, creating value through sustainability and having very long supply chains from one side of the world to the other. It's got to be a very, very different manufacturing uh, setup, a very different uh, setup of serving markets and semi-consumers uh, that is starting to take shape uh, today. Uh, and at the moment, it's taking shape in terms of multi-regional hubs. And maybe later on, it could be even below that. It could be, you know, 3D printing, for example, is a major technology that, that will drive a lot of changes and bring manufacturing and products a lot closer to, to customers. And one final point I want to make before I pass over is um, that th this, you know, technology has always been there. Technology is always developing, right? And, and yes, we have 5G today, we had 4G, we had other technologies, 3D. It's always been there and it's always working as a catalyst to help us advance. But we believe what's really going to make a difference um, is infrastructure. And countries, governments, regions will win or lose uh, this game of attracting the investment from manufacturing supply chains based on how much they invest in infrastructure, both in terms of physical infrastructure, for example, what Abdullah has mentioned about the ports, the airports, which are extremely important. And still, there's a huge gap of infrastructure around the world, but also the green economy infrastructure, uh, where at the moment, uh, many parts of the world, including the Southeast Asia, they're, they're way behind, but really trying to catch up. It's certainly a lot of hard and soft infrastructure discussions these days. Um, Walter, I, I saw your hand raised uh, earlier. Did you have something on this? Well, yeah. One of the key things that I see right now is the Belt and uh, Road Initiative, which will revolutionize supply chain infrastructure and communications. And we are trying very, very hard to identify opportunities within that. And as an example, um, in Myanmar, uh, we're able, in our first aid business, to be able to start to take materials from China into an area where we can get production of first aid bags. And of course, Myanmar makes millions of backpacks for retailers, major retailers throughout the world. In Pakistan, it's the same thing, but it's with metalworking. And we're using, or we intend to use the Belt and Road to bring raw materials from China, particularly steel that goes into our scissors, because they're the largest in the world and the, among the lowest cost producers. We can get that through the Belt and Road, get the production in Pakistan, and then have it go out the southern port, which is now being rebuilt. That's a major step forward. And it's unlike anything that's happened in the recent 20 years. It is, it is a big deal. So the Belt and Road and tying into that, I think gives you, you the ability to not only access markets and produce quickly, but eventually as the 5G gets installed through these locations, it totally opens up populations and raises their, their levels of income. Well, certainly, and we've seen, uh, at least in the, the G7 meetings, that there is a sort of a dueling sustainability and infrastructure plans. We have the Belt and Road, of course, for, for some time, and uh, some other developed markets trying to, to compete on that front, uh, perhaps with some political undertones. But um, I'm wondering uh, how that might play out. But uh, I saw Anil and uh, Yumiko, you, you both wanted to say something? 
Yeah, no, I just wanted to touch on two points. Uh, the first one on the ESG that you talked about, uh, and the second one was around the decision around countries, how they want to win in this uh, in the new uh, scenarios. On the ESG part, I think this is, this is a conversation that's very early on in discussion. So I think the point uh, Jerry made around uh, value creation versus risk mitigation clearly, but I think a lot has to be done in the context of standard setting, industry and infrastructure building, aligning on mechanics of uh, sustainability, the measurement methodologies. You know, we are talking of sustainability means different things to different people. They don't greenhouse gas reductions on one end of the third. Uh, the other end is carbon neutrality. The third one is recycling and reuse. And, you know, so there's a lot to happen. I think this is going to be a factor that is not yet well understood by uh, supply chains that needs to be built in as we go forward. And an important lever that as countries decide how they want to position themselves, this is going to be an important area of focus. Uh, if businesses are talking about it. I think countries are a bit disconnected at this point and they're avoiding a conversation. And in the same token, even most of the uh, global trade agreements that are being done right now are avoiding the critical issues around labor and, and uh, you know, the labor ethics uh, uh, or for that matter, uh, things related to IT, things related to uh, the sensitive topics. So I think countries will have to play an important role. Businesses are leading from the front, but I think the regions will have to catch up on that. Uh, just going back to your question, uh, uh, just another comment I wanted to make on a slightly related but different topic was, as we decide where, we, where regions want to win in manufacturing, I think it is important to recognize that goods that are traded that have labor arbitrage as a part of their component is a very small fraction of the global uh, uh, output that is generated. In fact, I think as we as regions strategize around how they want to win, countries strategize, they will have to take into account a different set of industries that don't get talked about enough, which is more focusing on building supply chains locally. So take examples of you know, resources, take Africa as an example. 60% of the world's arable land sits in Africa, but if you look at the agricultural industry in Africa, it is very, very low or under-evolved. Most of the natural resources coming out of Africa are sent out for processing. So I think regions will have to make a decision on what role they want to play in this new emerging supply chain. And an emphasis on value creation and job creation will come out of industries that are linked to services, linked to industries that are very close to their core, and labor arbitrage will continue to diminish. So this component of conversation in countries has to become an important part. So all the free trade agreements, all the strategies of economic zones being created are gradually getting, uh, will get marginalized if these components are not taken into account. So no one country can do it all or nor should they try to do it all, right? Special, specialization is key. Uh, Yumiko and then uh, Gareth, I think. Sure, just a very, a short comment on the question of ESG, as you pointed out, uh, Michelle, there are just so many different standards, uh, measurements when it comes to ESG um, a, all around the world. And that alone has created a lot of problems in terms of greenwashing and, and other, or other implications in the ESG investment um, uh, space. Uh, now let's look at the infrastructure side of things, especially in you know in uh, in developed economy um, uh, countries. And I think that uh, what we need to be careful of is that uh, there is no such a thing as you know uh, one size fit all uh, when it comes to ESG uh, investment. And I think it's a very important um, notion that we all have to share because. Uh, as I've been with OECD for eight years, and, and the reality is uh, much of the discussions around the ESG investment, around the ESG in general, have been um, promoted and pushed by uh, primarily developed economies, uh, primarily uh, EU countries, primarily countries like you know, Japan and, and, and the U.S. Um, and when it comes to uh, standardization, right now, like, there are a bunch of different standards. And there, there is a, a lot of push in terms of coming up with something a little bit more globally accepted. By by the way, that, that alone is not a bad thing to have something that's, you know, that, that can be used as, you know, one global standard. What's important is that when that discussion takes place, everybody here or other countries, your voices should be reflected. That's number one. And number two, there has to be uh, room for uh, flexibility in terms of how 
uh, some of these uh, ESG principles are implemented, depending on the market conditions, depending on the social economic conditions. Uh, and I don't think, it, again, I will go back to my point. You know, there is no such a thing as one size fit all when it comes to ESG um, ESG investment. So it's a little bit of a tag of war because you actually want to have something that's very widely accepted. You know, something that you can say, oh, this is the standard. This is the this is the you know this is the the measurement I'm going to use. And at the same time, we're dealing with the reality of the ground. When you are in in your countries in Asia, you know that some of these realities you see are just not compatible with the discussions you hear in the OECD office in Paris. Uh, so that's something that we have to be bear in mind. I think it's kind of important, especially when we talk about infrastructure, um, you know, uh, supply chain, um, you know, build up. Uh, that's a very very important part of the economic development in many other countries that we are touching here today. Thank you for that, Yumiko, especially as I know uh, ESG plays a large role in your professional life right now and, and certainly uh, impacts uh, you know everyone on the panel uh, in terms of thinking about how to keep an open mind about standardizing or or at least uh, treating case by case uh, these other countries and how they're dealing with ESG. I see a number of hands raised, but I, I just first wanted to invite the Deputy Undersecretary as well as uh, Abdulaziz to speak a little bit outside of Asia. We've talked a lot about the uh, Asia developing markets, um, but you know from, from Qatar's perspective, uh, a country that is well known to be a LNG powerhouse. How do you how do you kind of uh, re remold thinking around uh, what Qatar can offer in terms of uh, fourth industrial rev revolution, basing manufacturing, supporting your small businesses in, in some of these more digital and, and advanced technology realms? Uh, I think uh, I, I I mean you know Qatar invested heavily in the infrastructure. Uh, as Abdul Aziz mentioned, uh, we have a port with a capacity of 7.5 million container. Uh, we have an we, we have an airport, one of the best airports, one of the best uh, high cargo airlines uh, high, uh, high as well. The connectivities we is we are connecting more than 170 countries uh, among uh, all regions. Uh, so. We invest, as I mentioned, we invested heavily in the infrastructure, and uh, I just want to emphasize in uh, one of the speakers who mentioned that one of the most important things is the, the, the infrastructure readiness for, to attract this hub. Uh, so this is one. Two, also we are as a part of the GCC Countries also, we do have some of the free trade agreements between between these countries and as well as with the Arab countries. Uh, regarding the SMEs, I will uh, let Abdul Aziz to speak more in this area. But also regarding the SMEs, we we put uh, a huge programs and initiatives to to support the SMEs, as Abdul Aziz mentioned, especially after the blockade, we, yani, we've been interested so much in the manufacturing, in the food security, uh, in, uh, in other services as well as in the technology. We are we, we're having the most fastest internet in the world, and as well as the 5Gs, Uridu, they launched the 5Gs, which is already in all our uh, government uh, 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 facilities. But uh, again, I, 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 mean, I think that co the competition even among the GCC countries and among the region is a very high. And each country, for example, even, even in GCC country, we are competing with each other, with uh, Dubai and Jabal Ali, I also with uh, Saudi and King Abdul Aziz industrial area. So I think, mm -hmm. as I mentioned before, what we need to have is we need to have like an inter like an international oversight initiative to make to to secure all the supply chain and to also to make it more smoothly in the future. I think Abdul Aziz will emphasize more in the SMEs and in the Qatar high initiatives internally. Thank you, Saud. So uh, to add to what Saud uh, have mentioned, Qatar have focused a lot also within research and development and educational system to ensure that we have the right talent available and the right research and development infrastructure. 
Taking into consideration also that there is a, a great legislative system that would provide uh, protection of IP and ensure that uh, foreign investment is also protected within the country. When we focus at small and medium enterprises within the manufacturing sector in specific, uh, we have a clear strategy for, for the 2030 manufacturing national strategy, focusing at which sectors we, uh, we, we are supporting and how uh, we're focusing at uh, value-adding industries that are uh, more environmental friendly. For small and medium enterprises, we, uh, we have a list of a thousand manufacturers within the country and we support them by ensuring that we're solving challenges for them. And few of those uh, challenges are, uh, for example, accessibility to funding. So we ensure that uh, they can gain accessibility to, uh, to funding with easy terms. Uh, at the same time, we ensure that they have accessibility to markets, uh, both the local market. So uh, uh, what is made in Qatar is actually uh, having a more of a preferred treatment while selling locally. But at the same time, having the right support for, uh, for uh, uh, what's made in Qatar to be exported to neighboring countries. And I think Saud and others have explained on, on the, uh, the infrastructure that we have uh, uh, within, uh, within the country. So ensuring that they have accessibility to talent also and training is, is, a, is a great factor that we're also focusing on. Just quite recently, we launched uh, uh, an industrial capability uh, center in Qatar. Uh, we call it F1. It's the first in the region, and we've done it with McKinsey. Uh, this basically focuses on how to make manufacture, uh, 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 manufacturers more efficient. Uh, for example, I think the first cohort uh, is just finishing up. We have more than 10 uh, small and medium enterprises uh, factories in there. And we managed to reduce their, uh, uh, their expenses in, in terms of manufacturing by 40% and enhancing their revenue by 30%. And this type of support is what governments need to focus at, how to enhance the capabilities and the training and providing the right talent to those small and medium enterprises, how to ensure that they can, get, that they can gain access to funding with easy terms, how they can ensure that they can gain access to uh, local markets, neighboring markets, international markets, by providing them with the right uh, uh, FTA agreements, by providing them with the right infrastructure, by providing them with the right tools to ensure that they are more capable to be, uh, to be able to compete internationally. And in Qatar, what we're seeing basically is that we're having more born global institutions. It's, uh, uh, we're not uh, supporting those startups to become local startups only. We need them to become international startups from the beginning, from the get-go. And uh, the educational system is playing a big part within, within, that, uh, within that strategy. Uh, certainly thinking big. Uh, thank you both for that. Uh, I think the, the government support has certainly been a critical watch factor for all of us, as, especially <clears throat> as we come out of the pandemic and see how these businesses can be supported to, to move on and, and accelerate. Uh, Jerry, Nilesh, and then Gareth, I think, had uh, something to add. Yeah, th thanks, Michelle. So um, first of all, um, just reacting to um, our, our guest's uh, comments just now, I, th I think what Qatar is doing in terms of infrastructure is highly commendable and, and very much setting an example for, for many other countries in the world and economies in this same development space to, to do similar things. And, this links to my to my second point, which is that uh, we already mentioned that ESG is very broad um, and sustainability is a very broad topic. It's impossible for one government or one company to, 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 to tackle it in one go. Hence why it's very, very important to be able to break it down. And as I think um, Anil and some other of our colleagues said, it needs to be there needs to be some focus on, on what can we be good at? What can we excel at and then really drive that home? And there are, to that point, um, one of the things that we use at Bain with our clients, both in the public and private sector, is the whole concept of micro battles. And this seems to have worked very well for, for countries around the world, especially in ESG. For example, here in Singapore, where they launched recently their, um, their carbon exchange, uh, which is a major step for carbon trading around the world. This has been, you know, it, it's at a prototype level here, but it has the potential to really scale up and become the dominant exchange for carbon in the world. Other countries in Europe, like like Greece, for example, where they've launched a small micro battle with Volkswagen on electrification of whole islands from on, on everything to become fully independent on energy and many other parts of the world. So having those uh, small uh, test and learn uh, systems going around, prototyping, learning, becoming specialists in certain areas is equally important for governments and, and for companies, and it will help for sure to create that level of value that we talked about on ESG.
Thank you. And Neelash? Michelle, yeah, so I'll just quickly touch upon the social element in the ESG part. <clears throat> I think what we need to keep it in mind, and I see that, you know, some of the initiatives already uh, in the new policy, the countries like Qatar or uh, Vietnam they are taking, is that uh, typically we used to have about 120, 125 million people uh, who were employed in manufacturing globally. But then from 2017, this number is declining. So what it means is the traditional job and the labor in manufacturing, which were engaged more towards the blue collar job, now that part is reducing. Whereas because of technology, because of the other things, the service oriented jobs, uh, which are more towards the you know the technology aspects of it and all that. So the service oriented jobs in manufacturing are increasing. Mm -hmm. Net net manufacturing is creating employment because that's the most important social element for any given country. So every country is increasing the employment in manufacturing, but this employment increase is happening more in the service side of the segment. And that's where the training aspect, um, uh, you know, the upskilling aspect is very, very critical and important for us. Thank you, Neelish. Actually, that brings up a, a good uh, question I, I always have uh, for panelists. And, you know, government retraining programs, especially around next generation jobs, haven't always had a great track record. I'm, I'm wondering if uh, the consensus of the group here is that the private sector will be the driving force behind that sort of training. And if it's it's going to happen where, you know, you might hire someone who's undertrained, but you see uh, you know, great potential in, in training them up to exactly what you want to do. And that's that's the new model, uh, the dominant model from here on out. But uh, Gareth, I, I know you might have said something else to say, but uh, just just putting that question forward as well. Yeah, so just, just around the, the topic for ESG. So Jerry mentioned earlier on, you know, it's of keen interest now to boards and investors, I think also to consumers increasingly so. And, um, you know, as well as sort of experimenting and building capability in those small steps, I think one of the really critical things that all businesses can do is really focus on traceability and transparency throughout their supply chains. We, we've seen it in other industries and there have been a number of sort of food scandals where people didn't really understand where things were coming. Increasingly, we see evidence that consumers are interested not just where their products are made, but what goes into those products, where were those things made? And I think those companies who can get ahead of the curve and really demonstrate transparency and verify traceability of what goes into their products will have a huge competitive advantage in the future. And that's certainly where we're investing a lot of our efforts as we move forward. Great. Certainly knowing your, your audience, correct? Well, we only have a uh, very brief time left, but I, I wanted to invite anyone, uh, if there was something that we didn't cover to kind of uh, come forward with a provocative question or statement. <laughs> You know, I can add one piece that I think is being discussed, but I just wanted to add more color to it, is as we talk about products in the future, I think Nilesh alluded to that, the form of a product is also going to change. So we need to keep that in mind because products are going to expand to become more than product. And people are already talking of products as a service, right? What is today a product and tomorrow be a service? So the element of how we are steering our, our uh, value chains will have to recognize that component. So customization, being closer to customers and being able to meet the needs beyond the physical product will define. And I think in that case, everything that you said uh, uh, in terms of upskilling talent and you know get, getting the right quality of talent is important. And I've seen private entities have played a very important role, but clearly it's being evident across many regions, including the Qatar piece that we heard, or when I talked to the EDB in Singapore or BOI in Thailand, we clearly hear investment in innovation and talent capability building as an important piece. And I think that's why China in many ways has been ahead because they have been able to recognize that way ahead of time and have been able to steer uh, the focus onto high skilled and high uh, technology focus, which is probably going to be a long term sustain sustainable advantage for them. Yeah. Two, two last comments from my side, Michelle, just building on what Gar said on traceability. Traceability is going to be, is going to have, um, I won't be shy to use the word, monumental impact on manufacturing and supply chains, simply because traceability is never ending. It's not like you, the deep, the more traceability, the more visibility you provide, the more people want to know more. So it's almost like a vicious circle. 
Um, so we're at the every, very early stages of traceability, and that's probably going to be a key catalyst to move into uh, more regional manufacturing, more close to home manufacturing. Nobody wants to have to trace a supply chain that has 15 manufacturing points and doesn't know where it's coming from. Everybody will want to simplify to make it as simple as possible. And then the second comment on the training I'd like to make is that I don't think it's either private sector or public sector that needs to work on training and reskilling. I think it's both sides. Governments probably have more responsibility on how to start the education around how to think creative, innovation, innovative from the very early stages of education, first grade, second grade. So it's all about the, the education system. You fix that and you have a whole, um, you know, kids coming out with innovative, creative ideas, which can then pick, be picked up by the private sector to do the real training on specific areas and expertise. Right. Well, thank you. Just just under the buzzer. Thank you, Jerry, for finishing us off. And I, I certainly learned a lot from the panel today, the roundtable, and I appreciate all of you and uh, have a great week. Thank you.